Okay, welcome everyone. Can you hear me, Deborah? I do. Great. So welcome to our webinar on QI lessons from implementing group prenatal care. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website after. For today's speakers, we have Dr. Deborah Bingham and Dr. Audra Meadows, and I'll do bios for each of them. So Dr. Deborah Bingham is the founder and executive director of the Institute for Perinatal Quality Improvement, or PQI. Dr. Bingham is a public health leader, educator, author, and consultant with over 30 years of experience. She has successfully led hospital, state, and national improvement efforts and held key leadership positions. She is a registered nurse with a master's of science degree in perinatal nursing from Columbia University and a doctorate in public health from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Audra Meadows is a birth optimizer. As an OBGYN at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Meadows teaches medical students, residents, and fellows. Her clinical public health and policy initiatives aim to prevent preterm birth, infant and maternal morbidity and mortality. And she implemented group prenatal care into the BWH OBGYN residency practice to better serve those pregnant and parenting. Dr. Meadows also co-leads the Perinatal Neonatal Quality Improvement Network of Massachusetts, or PINQUIN. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Bingham to begin. Great, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. I know that uh, these are really challenging times and uh, you know, all of, all of the things that are going on around the COVID pandemic. Um, and we just wanted to let you know that we're hoping that you and your family are doing well and your um, loved ones and we also want to just honor everyone who is serving out on the front lines, providing care uh, during this pandemic, and also just all of the many people who are also working to ensure equity and care and willing to speak up against racism. See some familiar names and uh, on this webinar from previous conversations. We need uh, speak up champions uh, more now more than ever. So just to kind of give a little bit of brief overview and then turn it over to Dr. Meadows, I just wanted to give you an update on what's happening at, at the Institute for Perinatal Quality Improvement. As you may know, the mission of uh, the P Institute for Perinatal Quality Improvement is to expand the use of improvement science to eliminate preventable perinatal morbidity and mortality and end perinatal racial and ethnic disparities. We've been working hard to meet this mission. I want to thank the members of our executive advisory board uh, and Dr. Audra Meadows, who's speaking today, is a member of that board and want to just thank her for all of her contributions, as well as many other, as you can see, many uh, amazing leaders throughout the country uh, serve on this board from many disciplines, from anesthesia, from nursing, from, um, from patient advocacy, et cetera. We also have an editorial advisory board uh, that we meet with regularly and we want to thank them for their contributions and all the ways in which they also are supporting uh, the mission and the growth of PQI. Uh, legally, we are almost five years old, so it's pretty exciting. We will be um, uh, setting up uh, functionally. Our website didn't launch until like uh, a year later, but we are excited in May. Uh, as of June 1st, we will, we're technically a, uh, five years old as an organization. So that's really exciting all that we've been able to accomplish. So here, my brief update from PQI is uh, many of you may have seen recently, they released the 2017 um, pregnancy related mortality data from the CDC. And the rate has got the ratio in 2017 slightly increased from 2016, but I, statistically not much different than uh, the last few years. So I would consider pretty much st staying steady, but definitely not decreasing. So we d do have a lot of work to do and our work is needed more uh, than ever. And then we also have, um, just want to talk about just the disparities are still very stark. Uh, some states, the disparities are as high as eight times higher for black women. Nationally, they're um, 
you know, around three times, a little over three times higher for black women than a white non-Hispanic women. We also have seen a rise in uh, maternal morbidity. We don't have more recent data. This is the re most recent data we have available, but this almost 200% increase in um, severe maternal morbidity, primarily due to uh, the use of transfusions or the need for transfusions, because we know that there's also a lot of women where we don't give the transfusions early enough. So this, this requirement for more blood transfusion is very concerning as well as other rise in other types of severe morbidity. And we know a lot of that is due to overuse of C-section. So with those data as kind of high levels, level setting data to just tell you why we, why this organization exists. And one of the big priorities, as I said, is really dismantling racism to eliminate perinatal disparities and racial disparities. And we know that conversations like we're having today is where change begins and that each one of us has the power to change the conversation and really speak up against racism in the perinatal health care. Um, it isn't due to racial differences in people's ge genetics that are causing these disparities. It's really due to the structural and also individually mediated uh, acts of overt and, and um, implicit, primarily implicit biases that that, that uh, lead to these, these poor outcomes. With that in mind, we created what's called the Speak Up Against Racism program. And this is um, the acronym as well as a mnemonic is the Speak Up. And it, it talks about all the different ways in which you can speak up and the things you can do individually to really start to examine your own behaviors and start to address how you can change the system by speaking up, by setting limits, practicing, prepare, express concerns, apologize, keep improving, uncover and learn and persuading others. But it's a journey, it's not a sprint. And so we've come up with a whole action pathway um, that includes um, steps one, two, three is foundational where every we would love every single perinatal clinician to accomplish each one of these three steps. And then individuals who, after they've completed those three steps, uh, which includes attending a live educational session, is to then uh, become uh, ambassadors, speak up ambassadors. And we do have an, uh, a speak up ambassador course coming up in the in July. You'll you'll get more announcements about that. And then some people will go on and want to become faculty and help spread the speak up program across the country. So we have, if you want to learn more about the Speak Up program, you can go to our website and you can read all about the program and see the pathway there. I know I just flipped so quickly, you wouldn't be able to really see that, um, that pathway on my slide. We also launched this year, it's very exciting, um, a 28-day anti-racism challenge. And this is, um, you can even though we um, actively launched it in February with daily email reminders, it's still up and active. You can go in and at any time that's convenient for yourself, like uh, participate in a 28-day challenge. And we are considering when we'll repeat this same 28-day challenge for uh, those who were not able to participate in February with us. And also, if you just want to just uh, remind yourself and to get, uh, or you couldn't finish every activity. We are offering our next Speak Up National Speak Up Champions course is on May 20th and 27th. And I recommend you register now. The spots are very tight. Um, we actually had to turn people away in February. We do limit how many people can come to this conference. So if you're interested in becoming a Speak Up Champion, register now um, and that this will uh, make it possible for you to also attend uh, it's a prerequisite that you've completed this course to be able to attend the July Speak Up Ambassador course. We have online modules uh, that you can then you can uh, access or you can use for your teams. This is so not everyone can go to the virtual uh, trainings, but also uh, just to, if you want to get teams ready with the virtual uh, ready for the virtual trainings, there's some online modules as well. Um, 
and they um, are CME and we just got CME approval. So it's exciting. And I'm just so thrilled to announce that um, that uh, the program has grown enough that we were able to uh, bring on Renee Byfield as the she had been the core faculty and helped uh, create the Speak Up program. And now she is going to be um, she is now the program director for Speak Up. So that's so thank you for everyone who helped us grow to make this possible. We put up PQI profiles on cool things everybody's doing. We want to spread the good work you're doing. We know you don't always have time to write up all your, your, um, all the cool things you did. So if you have a great QI project you want to tell us about, let us know. We're happy to uh, do an interview and make it easy. We write it up for you and then, um, and then post it so others can learn from your great work. And again, the mission is to expand the use of quality improvement. F, uh, and so we also on June 8th have a conference where it's kind of the nuts and bolts around QI. And you can be with other perinatal leaders and hear about their QI projects. We'll go, uh, it's very much a, a very hands on virtual conference uh, that I think you'll find to be very interactive and reinforce things that you already know, but also uh, will teach you new things as well um, in how you can lead and be more effective in leading QI efforts. We're also, and this is my last update before I turn it over to Dr. Meadows, but we're working to increase the use of intermittent auscultation. We, one of the ways in which we know that C-section rates are driving morbidity rates. And so, um, and one of the biggest ways in which we can help um, increase um, vaginal births and support vaginal births is freedom of movement. Um, and so uh, one of the challenges that teams have is that they don't have a lot of skill sets or a lot of ways to practice how to how to safely administer or perform intermittent auscultation. So we've put together a simulation-based educational program um, that uh, some midwifery schools across the country are using as like for all of their students to help ensure competence in intermittent auscultation. Birthing centers that newly opened due to the pandemic used it to bring their staff up to speed. And then we have um, high-risk centers who are using the education for their staff. So um, it's very um, it's very interactive. It's simulation based. There are five simulations um, that uh, that that the learner needs to will actually have the experience of listening and uh, assessing the the heart rates and uh, with contraction video, like saying when the contraction starts and ends. So it's really, it's super cool education. We get great feedback. Um, the only thing that people recommend is that they want more uh, exercises, more more simulations. We added two uh, to make it five, um, but I think we'll create some more um, some more simulations for people. People want more time to practice. So we know it's really hitting uh, a meeting a need for the country. So again, QI saves lives. So all of your efforts to implement QI is so critical. If you have any questions, suggestions, we really um, value our uh, opportunity to be partners with you and work with all of you and really help support each other in any efforts we're doing to lead QI efforts in the country. And it's just so great to get to know all of the cool things you're doing. So thank you for all of your connections and all of um, sharing with us your journeys and what you're learning as well. So I'm now going to turn the time over to Dr. Meadows, um, and she's going to uh, be giving you her presentation and, and, and teach you about QI lessons she's learned when she implemented group prenatal care. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Audra. Thank you. I want to ensure that everyone can see our, my screen. Yes, I see it. It looks great. Oh, fantastic. So I want to say... Moving from West Coast to East Coast, good morning and good afternoon. I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen so that I can, I'm not stop sharing my screen. I will actually stop um, my video so that we can begin to um, focus on the presentation. So I'd like to talk today about QI lessons from implementing group prenatal care. 
Uh, I have no disclosures except that I am faculty for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and wanted to offer a special thanks to Centering Healthcare Institute and to Sharon Rising. I couldn't start this presentation without that. Uh, given the inspiration from Sharon over the years um, and that got me interested in group prenatal care um, and the work that we've done across uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital and in Massachusetts related to group prenatal care um, began with inspiration from her work founding the Centering Healthcare Institute. So today I wanted to spend a moment to discuss and understand our challenges and the challenges for, from my perspective is that of preterm birth, infant mortality, and the racial inequities wanted to talk about the challenge of innovating in obstetrical care, which is that of implementing uh, opportunities like group prenatal care. Describe the opportunity and the evidence of the benefits of group care, and then highlight some quality improvement tools to facilitate implementation. Uh, and I'll, I'll end with some policy commentary. So I like to always show this slide because as an OBGYN, uh, my love in delivering babies and, and supporting moms in that journey is that we, we all think about sort of the end goal as well, uh, the health of mom and the health of baby and what we're trying to do um, as parents uh, when our children are born to make sure that they have the, the healthiest start to life. And so that's something that I worked for in my career. And I know many of you do as well. Maternal and infant morbidity and mortality are both our, our challenge and opportunity. So I'm gonna start with a case um, to be case-based, and so I'd love to see um, questions in the chat along the way as well. Happy to continue to watch and answer those questions. I'll start with a patient that is a patient of mine um, from years ago, actually, CB, who was 20 years old, and she um, came to tell her story uh, in her second pregnancy, actually, with me, of her unfavorable pregnancy experience, and so when she was 20, she received adequate prenatal care with a provider of her choice. She did not have much social support or engagement from um, friends through a support network, and she eventually found that at her church. She did experience sickness, morning sickness throughout her entire pregnancy and often felt like a burden to her family, difficulties with schooling. Um, she delivered a preterm infant at 32 weeks and suffered a significant delayed postpartum hemorrhage, and she spent the first eight weeks of motherhood in the neonatal ICU caring for her infant. And so now she's presenting at age 25, and she's saying that now her now spouse, they want to grow their family, but she's afraid to after what happened. And so I recall those words, I'm afraid to have another baby after what happened. And it helped me to think more about, you know, the, the medical part of this and the healthcare system delivery part of this conversation. And so what are her risks? And based on her age and her race, she's at an increased risk from um, pregnancy and from other social determinants of inadequate prenatal care, poor breastfeeding initiation, physical abuse or domestic violence, uh, uh, low birth weight, preterm birth and infant death. And so as an obst as her obstetrician, my goal was to ensure that she not only had the best opportunity for the best birth experience, but also a really a great opportunity for the best birth outcome. And so in considering all of these risks, I wanted to take a moment together to think through that ultimate risk of the, that of infant mortality and infant death. So infant death being de that of death of the infant in the first year of life. Um, this is a, a pretty grim topic to jump right into, but this is ultimately what I wanted to avoid for her as well, knowing that she was at an elevated risk here. Um, the U.S. infant mortality rates between 2007 and 2017 have decreased over time, but again, there is no acceptable number. Despite that dec decrease, we know that infant mortality still is highest among Black infants. Infant mortality, um, is that an indicator of our population health and well-being? And so, Thinking of that, this really speaks more to the experiences of these groups and communities. Um, we know that race is a social construct and not biologic. And so this is not a risk that genetically predisposes her to having an infant preterm or predisposes her to having an infant that should die in the first year of life. But we do know that infant mortality is highest among black infants. It's also highest among those who are under age 20. So I know that in her first pregnancy, her baby was born prematurely, but, but thrived and did well. Um, but with that said, we knew that she was at elevated risk because at that time she was, um, that she was delivering, she was, during her pregnancy, she was under 20, she had just turned 20. Um, and then she continued to be at elevated risk between 20 and 24, and then that risk begins to go down, but then increases again with older age. 
and the rates in the US exceed that of other developed nations. And by far, the United States infant mortality rate is approximates six. And in other countries like Japan, which is actually that data is reported for 2016 and not 2017, um, but it's been as low as two. The average of these comparable countries is around three. And so we do know that this is um, one of those shocking, alarming, and unjust disparities that is worth tackling and, and needs uh, a closer look in our clinical delivery systems. Infant mortality is also highest, as we can only imagine, among Southern states. And that's because in Southern states, that's where you find the greatest population of, of Black Americans in this country. So I'm going to take a big step backwards in time and show this, this slide, because at that time when I was doing this work and beginning this work in Boston, we had looked at the Boston infant mortality rates by race ethnicity as well. And in the city of Boston, in these three year time periods, time one was 2001 to 2004, and two was 2005 to 2008, and time period three was 2009 to 2012. And so we'd looked over this time because at that point I'd been working as the medical director for the Boston Healthy Start Initiative. And we were thinking through all of our clinical and social uh, interventions and programs to improve the preterm birth rates um, to affect the infant mortality rate. And we saw a decrease, which was fantastic. And so we noted though, when we started this work that the infant mortality rate for black women in Boston was as high as 13.1. And so I'm just gonna just take a peek back here. Notice 13.1 is well beyond any of these numbers you see here. And then even if you took black women out of the entire United States infant mortality rate, that rate for white women is still higher than that of all of these other developed nations, which is just unacceptable. And so we continue to do work in the city of Boston to address this and to see what we could do to, to change those numbers. And, and we were happy to see these, these numbers decrease, but you can only imagine how we were feeling what we were thinking back in 2007 and 2008 when those numbers were as high as 13 to 12. And that disparity was three to four times that of white women or Asian Americans in uh, Boston area. So I wanna start with our first take home point and just pause so that we all sort of land on one, stick the landing on one issue, that there are high infant mortality rates in the United States relative to other developed nations. And black babies in the US diet rates twice to in some cities like Boston in the past, four times that of other racial groups. And even the white infant mortality rate in the US is still it still outranks that 27 other countries. And so what are the causes of infant mortality? And so the five leading causes of death, of infant death in 2018 um, are birth defects. It's been the leading cause for, for the over decades, preterm birth being the second leading cause and then maternal pregnancy complications, SIDS and injuries are among the top five. But what I wanna say here is that the infant mortality causes by race, preterm birth accounts for the black white infant mortality disparity. That's important to note. So these slides, I won't dig deep and you'll need your reader glasses to be able to see them well. What I wanna point out here is whether you're 15 to 19, preterm birth is the reason for black women who have infant deaths, um, is the, it is the cause. If you live in Texas, if you live in the United States, if you live in Massachusetts, I'm just pulling, I pulled some slides to show that that bar on the uh, left side, that green bar that's going out the farthest, those are infant mortality, that is the reason for infant mortality in the age group of 15 to 19 in the United States for Black individuals. It is disorders related to short gestation and low birth rate. That's preterm birth. And then there, the top bar in Texas, um, those are Black individuals. And that maroon bar is short gestation and low birth weight. That is preterm birth. And so no matter where you are, this is the issue that we're tackling in order to address this disparity. Preterm birth in the United States, as you can see, also highest in the Southern states where more Black Americans live. And preterm birth in the United States has actually been increasing from 2008 to 2018. So you see here, uh, the March of Dimes provides this data through their Perry stats. And we see from 2008, a preterm birth rate of 10.4% um, of live births and going all the way over. It was decreasing for some time, and we were happy to see that it's been increasing from 2014, I'm sorry, 2015 forward, and actually for the last five years. And of course, preterm birth is highest among Black births. 
And so when you see here, the preterm birth rates by race and ethnicity in the United States from 2017 to 2019 average, and that's not different years before that, this is just the most recent data for black births, it's the highest and it's 14. And it's also starting to get higher for um, Native Americans and for, or Native um, American, Indian, Alaskan Native. So I wanna stick a landing on take home point number two, and then we're gonna dive into more. This is a QI talk and we're gonna to get to there, but we really want, I really wanted to underscore the reason why this is so important and to highlight Deborah's comment that QI saves lives because with implementing and with using QI as a, to successfully help implementation of clinical tools to, to make a difference, we can work to save lives. The take home point number two, preterm birth related deaths are the second leading cause of infant mortality but is the reason and accounts for the racial disparity in infant mortality. So let's take a little bit more of a, a look at the root cause of the disparity. So we know now preterm birth and low birth weight birth. So when we thought about this uh, as a team, we thought about the difference between risk versus care. Now often, and to be sure, we will hear many providers and we will also hear people who are um, scientists say that maybe this difference is due to risk, potentially genetic risk. We know that the genetic risk is not the reason. We do not need to continue to use race as a proxy for genetic differences. It is not, it is a social construct. So we do know that there are risks related to the environment. So we're moving away from the genes and looking at the environment. And within the environment, we have conversations around poverty, education, and stress. And we focused in on, on stress. But related to that, I could show you slides how Generally, when one increases their uh, income level or their position in society financially, that can be protective. Not so much the case for Black women when it comes to preterm birth and infant mortality. Despite higher levels of income and despite higher levels of education, Black women are more likely to live, deliver a preterm baby and have a baby experience death in the first year of life than any other group, even with those increases. And so, with not having that protective factor, thinking about how we can affect the um, effects of stress or counteract, I should say, the effects of stress, whether those are through the generational effects of racism, bias, um, experiences in, the, in their community, toxic stress, the um, impact on the body's neuroendocrine or immune inflammatory response. Those were areas we wanted to take a look at. We also wanna think about whether or not this root cause is a difference in care. Is this a difference in access to care? And so Massachusetts at the time being a state that provided ample access to care and, and access was high among, you know, the insured population was somewhere in the, in the high 90s percent, um, 92 to 98% now. Um, now we looked at differences in the care received. And so many of you may remember the Institute of Medicine report that showed that we started to notice disparities in this country in medicine, um, especially as we looked at the kinds of care that was received. So then it turned our attention to thinking, what is the OB care providers? And when I say OB care provider, I'm not just thinking the obstetrician, I'm just thinking about obstetrics, prenatal, I'm thinking about midwifery, family medicine that practices obstetrics, um, our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants in the clinics. What are our care providers role in reducing preterm birth and eliminating infant death disparities? What can we do? And so we thought about some of that, that in order to reduce preterm birth and infant mortality and the disparities, we needed to make sure we, rose, we would raise awareness of the medical, social, economic, and political factors related to this. And so what, what I'm doing now with you, and, and, and many of you are already aware of all of these facts, especially I can see um, and who's attending. Um, many of you have had this background in, in midwifery, especially where your uh, connection to the social determinants of health and your connection to the role that it plays in health outcomes is really baked into your training and, and really wanting to spread that understanding across those that are training in, in the MD world as well. And so as a medical director of a clinical practice that trained obstetrical residents is really important that we also worked at that stage to raise that awareness. Also we wanted to change and adapt practice. We all know um, Einstein's definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. And we would often hear, we'd often go to conferences and hear people talking about wanting improvements and different outcomes. However, that was not usually accompanied by changing the way we practice in medicine. And we have to do that. We have to change and adapt our practice to be high quality, patient-centered and evidence-based. 
We also wanted to raise awareness through infusing this into research and then also training our future providers. And so with that, um, I moved into looking at preterm birth prevention and I'm gonna focus here on group prenatal care. Uh, at the time in our practice, we were focusing on a few areas. We were looking at progesterone for the prevention of preterm birth, which we've moved away from. Um, and I sit, continue to say we, I was formerly at, formerly at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I was there for you know, the better part of 17 years. Um, however, I've now moved to Southern California. And so I'm not clinically at Brigham and Women's Hospital, but we'll continue to talk about and say weak because I'm still feeling very much a part of the practice that I was um, helped to shape for so many years. So when we thought about group prenatal care, we were moved by work that was done by Sharon Rising and what was happening with Centering Pregnancy and the Centering Healthcare Institute. Um, we also knew that there was Expect With Me um, as time moved on that developed as a model. And then there was a March of Dimes supportive pregnancy care model. Our model, though I'm gonna continue to use the term group prenatal care, our model that we followed was a version of Centering Pregnancy. And I say a version because we began using the notebooks with Centering Pregnancy. And then as time moved on, we sort of started to develop and do things a little bit in, in our own way. However, we continued to follow those 13 essential elements of prenatal care. So I wanted to, to pay homage and respect to the fact that even though I'm saying group prenatal care, we, we modeled what we did after Centering Pregnancy. So first we started with the evidence. We, we spent time talking with everyone about what the evidence is that group prenatal care could be beneficial. And so we explained that there were three randomized controlled trials that demonstrated decreased preterm births, higher birth weights, increased rates of breastfeeding, increased prenatal, prenatal knowledge among participants, higher satisfaction with care. I mean, what more could you ask for uh, when you're an OB provider that this is what you could give in comparison to traditional care? Now, with that, uh, there were retrospective cohort studies that also demonstrated a reduction in preterm birth and decreased cesarean rates. And that was, um, the decreased cesarean was really interesting. That was uh, by Dr. Barr, who is a family medicine um, doc in Western Massachusetts and her team in her family medicine residency. That was um, great information to gain. Also um, later in 2017, Dr. Boyce Carter at um, University of Washington uh, and her team worked on a systematic review and a meta-analysis that also showed that group prenatal care performed equivalently to traditional care, but that when you looked at the subpopulations that they studied, you did see those lower rates of preterm birth among women who identified as Black or African American. So again, we wanted to continue to raise awareness that that group prenatal care offered a promising alternative model for preventing poor birth outcomes, reducing racial disparities in preterm birth, educating and supporting pregnant women, and increasing patient and provider satisfaction. So we didn't want to do this work without making sure that everyone was feeling a level of benefit to this. So at Brigham and Women's Hospital, our group prenatal care um, journey also started with me doing um, something that is unpublished data, but among the more than 260 OBGYN residency training programs, we surveyed program directors uh, and we asked questions about what were the barriers and challenges to implementing and, and providing group prenatal care in their training practices. And we wanted to know that information. And I, I particularly want to know that information because as we got ready to do this work, um, we wanted to know what were gonna be some of our barriers and what we'd need to overcome. And what we learned from them, and this is um, unpublished data of a really nicely responded uh, survey, which I think we had a 62% response rate, is that we found that it was not feasible with current resident schedules, that they lacked space to conduct groups, there was cost related to materials and training, et cetera. They lacked resident and training curriculums to how to integrate this in a toolkit. They lacked interest among faculty or available availability of faculty to train the residents in this work. Lack of interest among residents was a concern um, and difficulty recruiting patients to participate. And um, I use the word recruiting because that was the word that was given to us in the responses, but we use the word enroll and not recruit because we, um, preferred that as a word. That said, uh, we decided that we wanted to initiate group prenatal care because of the education support and risk assessment and empowerment women would experience. Uh, we 
the way ours was set up is we gave the initial private OB visit with an RN and an MD to establish care. And then around six to 10 women with similar due dates met throughout their pregnancies for two hour visits, um, up to nine sessions where we addressed their concerns of pregnancy. We built community, we provided snacks, we provided patient education and resiliency training. Uh, we also had these facilitated discussions, not didactic, and we followed a predetermined curriculum using the Centering Pregnancy model. Um, and then we also brought in our OBGYN interns because something that I did learn from Sharon Rising is we really wanted to train providers to listen and to hear moms. And this is really an important time for that, given that as we talk about maternal morbidity and mortality, and we see often in the media that Black women who are suffering the worst outcomes of that are often saying they don't feel heard. And it's important that we find ways in our training to train our providers to learn to lean back and listen to women and hear what they're saying. And so those co-facilitated sessions um, that we invited our interns, we know really accomplished that because also we have surveys with the residents as they participated that showed that they had that experience. So I just wanted to show here our brochure um, that we had gotten started just to sort of bring some fun to the work. So I wanna give you a little bit of the history and then I wanna come more into the, into the depths of the QI. So group prenatal care for us began in 2010 to 2013. We began with our midwifery groups. Our midwifery groups were fantastic. They taught me about group prenatal care. Um, I had folks at our Brigham and Women's Center for Community Health and Health Equity, um, Maisha Duyonkova, who also taught me about group prenatal care. And I felt a way about that because I had just graduated from a residency program where I'd learned for four years all the ways to functionally care for in a medical, um, through a medical lens, women while they were pregnant or during their reproductive years into uh, gynecology and had not heard of group prenatal care. And when I finished um, training and learned more about it and learned from our midwives, group prenatal care had begun in our midwifery practice um, and was happening there from 2010 to 2013. Um, but it ended because of lack of dedicated space and lack of staff support and, and the coordination support it was really tough. It was having to happen in the waiting room and after hours and it, 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 group prenatal care is not a light lift. It's not, and it's a labor of love and one that's very much worth it. And I say that not to um, ward anyone off from attempting or moving that direction. It is a wonderful experience. Uh, it does take a, a good amount of support and coordination. And for those of you who may use um, Centering Healthcare Institute, they have an entire organization to help with that arrangement of organizing that with others as you um, do the work. Um, but in that time frame, in 2010 to 2013, we did become centering certified as a, as a hospital site. And then our group prenatal care resumed in July of 2015 with our MD trainees. So this is when I stepped in and, and looked at this again, um, because I was in support of the staff with the midwives as group prenatal care was happening there, um, but it was not leading that effort as it sort of, um, as we wanted to bring this back to our clinical space and bring it into residency training, uh, we were able to secure space, we were able to secure nurse, nursing support and secure funding to um, improve the technology and the space support and et cetera. We expanded our staff certification and we trained our physicians. Three is the number listed here, actually it turned out to be four in the end. Um, and we started with two RNs. I didn't even add in that we trained six MAs to get certification in group prenatal care. And so we expanded our service and our training supports. And so we did have some challenges um, that the space was a challenge and that it was in a separate space from our general clinical space was not specifically designed for that purpose. Uh, we did have to go through some design elements in order to get it ready um, and to make sure that it was up to code of being a, a, an official clinical um, space with the distance between the space in the bathroom and the sink, et cetera. Um, there were costs to that for the materials and the support staffing and the training for, um, to get everyone um, some time with group prenatal care through the Centering Healthcare Institute so that we could improve buy-in because it's a really fun training. Um, leading change within an organization, that probably should have been at the top of my list. It was really difficult to continue to initiate, administer, and maintain the practice over those years. Um, but once we hit the fifth year mark, group prenatal care continued and sustained itself at Brigham Women's Hospital. And so for that, I'm eternally grateful and, and thrilled. Some areas of complexity were patient enrollment and how to do that and the resident scheduling. Um, 
as well as uh, at the time, a lack of a resident training curriculum and a toolkit, which we agreed was also difficult because the residents um, had different questions and it would be nice to have provided them something beforehand. And so they sort of learned um, on the job and just during training. And there was the additional burden of, of staff um, needing to set up the room and turn it over, reminder calls, and it was just a very unique scheduling. Um, so with that, we had some factors for success. We had motivation of our providers and our physician champions and motivated staff. We did have buy-in from hospital leadership. The fact that we had some um, money that came from a Medicaid ACO project that we had applied um, to get money from. Um, we anticipated the changes and we tackled the problems and we were organized and we used a lot of frequent and clear communication. Um, so I'm gonna just move past this because I wanna get into this step here. So what was our improvement process? Step one in getting this off the ground again um, from a QI standpoint, because at that point I was also working with our state perinatal quality collaborative, which I'm continue to be a co-lead um, to this day in Massachusetts of PINQUIN, our perinatal neonatal quality improvement network. Um, as I was working with PINQUIN and we were teaching QI in other areas, we, we took a quality improvement lens and applied it here as well. And our first step was in teaming. We identified our team within the clinic, clinical site. Um, we also identified um, an advisory board across the hospital. And I did that through the support of now what is called the Stronger Generations Program at Brigham Women's Hospital led by Ariel Childs. And at the time, Maisha Duyon Cover was there. And we worked together to get staff across the hospital to be part of our Centering Pregnancy or Group Prenatal Care Advisory Board. And this was just to get buy-in and to make sure that we'd have the ability to have folks know what it was that it was happening, get coordination. So we gathered and reviewed some data and looked at our outcomes data um, that it ha had happened with the original um, implementation of group prenatal care and saw that the outcomes had improved. And we also looked at some data that showed the voices of women and, and patients who had participated that how much they enjoyed their care and how much it improved compliance to care. And I actually, forgive me for using that word, that's just the MD in me. I don't really want to use the word compliance, but, but the fact that people related to the care that was being provided and continued to work in a shared um, process with their clinicians to um, move their care forward. We also reviewed our policies within our site to determine how this would uh, be implemented. So the issue, and I wanted to pause on this to say this and really draw a really big yellow highlight marker around this comment. When you implement group prenatal care into a practice that offers traditional care, and you're not changing the whole practice to be one that only offers traditional group prenatal care, you're adding to everyone's job. And with that, in an already stressed um, clinical site, with competing priorities, um, a really vulnerable population. Our population was 75% um, of our patients. I'll come back to here. Um, the, our practice provided care to over a thousand women a year, greater than 75% were publicly insured. Many um, had social needs that we were meeting often. Um, we also, and looking at this data and reviewing our data, we knew, knew that our mass health moms, um, so our moms that were on Medicaid, 8.4% of them had preterm births, whereas in, in Massachusetts, whereas women who are in Massachusetts who were in the centering counts information or database, we knew that their preterm birth rates were 5.1%. So it also helped to really get some energy moving forward to want to do this work. So as a result, you know, we were able to move forward and reinvigorating this clinical practice of group prenatal care with the, with the residents. And again, to improve birth preparation experiences, outcomes, enhance resident education, and increase provider and staff um, preparation. So then the second thing that we did is we worked to design our process. And so we identified our key drivers and what those were and what our interventions were gonna be. So I'm gonna come back to key drivers because I wanted to show this aim statement. So in around June, 2016, we'd already started doing some of this work. So some of this was not in complete order of usually when you're doing QI and you first form your team and you sit down and create your aim statement and do your driver diagram. We'd actually started working on our driver diagram and continue to refine our aim statement. So I like to show this aim statement, which I think was, was more refined. And our goal was in order to improve perinatal outcomes and reduce rates of preterm birth, C-section, breast and increased breastfeeding initiation, and increased LARC use, we wanted to increase the percentage of pregnant patients ages 21 to 30. So we really focused in on that 
group that we felt was most vulnerable. We wanted to increase the percentage of those enrolled in group prenatal care from what was 12% um, at the time that we were doing this AIM statement, we'd already started in July, 2015, to upwards of 40% in January of 2020. Um, I'm sorry, I was gonna say 2021, in January of 2017. And so with that, we needed to operationalize now. We wanted to create our workflows and use the model for improvement and work on refinement and sustainability. And boy, when I say it's a labor of love, we work on refinement and sustainability often. And so we had, the way we had it set up, we had weekly meetings. And during our weekly meetings, our team, the nurse, myself, if a resident that was participating could attend, um, the coordinator that we were able to um, get funding to support, um, and we'd have students that would come through, um, and especially those who were working on getting their uh, MPH to support that work. And so with that, we thought about our staff and funding, our timing, our space supplies, our coordination, education, our data reviews, our primary drivers. And we listed change concepts and we thought those through and we talked about these. And we did our PDSA cycles at each meeting. Now, we actually had a, a PDSA form that we'd started out and sort of um, planned to use, but in all um, actuality and realization on the ground, when we sat in our meetings, we would discuss things. And so in a lot of ways, it was a PDSA. We would plan, we'd do, and we'd come back and talk about it and we'd make those changes. However, we didn't actually write it out as PDSA cycles because we didn't use the form. One of the things that helped move this forward tremendously was the fact that we got Medicaid funding. And so in October of 2017, our program was awarded $200,000 from our partners Medicaid ACO program um, to see if they could, we could increase volume and maintain our optimal outcomes because we'd shown them that we had some really great success with, with um, making sure that our preterm birth rates were lower actually. And so people really liked that. And so our four areas of development were of course, clinical practice continuing to train our staff and increase our enrollment, teaching and resident education, program evaluation, we wanted to know that what we were doing, that change was truly leading to an improvement. And we wanted to um, also look at innovation. Let's see, I was actually gonna take a pause because I wanted to take a quick look at um, any of the chat as well as we were, as I'm talking. Yeah, um, do you want me to read you any questions? Yeah, yeah, because I want because I'm going to give you some information about our evaluation, but before I do, I want to make sure that I'm not getting too far down the road without responding to a couple of comments in the chat. Yeah, there was one from Melanie that said, um, is there racial disparity in PTB and IMR in other developed countries? Is the racial disparity in preterm birth and infant mortality rates in other developed countries in the same? No, it's not actually. Um, this is a, a problem in the United States that has, um, it's really, uh, you can find actually, and so this speaks to the speak up training and what folks learn um, through Dr. Bingham and, and Renee Byfield and speak up training. If you look at countries that um, are touched by um, colonization and slavery, um, and you look at how that has impacted their uh, or affected their communities moving forward into modern day, those are the countries where you will see racial disparities among all outcomes. And so it's no, um, it's not an accident that in America, you can take any particular um, uh, illness or disease outcome, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, and see this racial disparity moving in the direction where it's worse for black individuals. And you can see that also in other countries that have had similar foundings where um, racial differences were really part of the fabric of the development of those societies and their economies. Um, you don't see that, for instance, if you just looked in, and, and there have been studies that we've shown and compared, you look at women who are from Western Africa who have not been in the United States, women who are more than one generation into the United States, and then look at white women in the United States and compare them. The worst outcomes are for those who are African-American in the United States. When you look at West African women, who've never been exposed to the societal ills of the US when it comes to racial differences, they will have outcomes similar to white women. Um, and so those that they have better outcomes and it's, it's a shame and it's something that we can continue to work on. But yes, you will actually see those disparities in other places that have a similar back historical um, backdrop. You do not see that if you're in other countries that don't have that. Great, and then we had 
one other question from Kara saying, are there any health systems as a whole who use group prenatal care or are they usually only site specific? You know, I, I think that there's somebody else that could probably also answer that question. Um, that and I know Mary Fitzmaurice and, and Sharon are on the call. From what I am aware of, I think group prenatal care, there have been, I'm pretty sure there's been some work to get some systems to move it across, but I'm only aware of the site specific um, integration of group prenatal care as people have found physician champions who wanted to integrate. Um, and I'd love to invite, you know, uh, either Sharon or Mary to put that into the chat if they know of other sites that, that might have. Um, use it as an entire health system. So I'll say also, um, that's a good question to segue me back into talking about our evaluation, because when we evaluated our experience of group prenatal care, we identified that we wanted to improve maternal newborn outcomes for patients. And we also wanted to decrease Medicaid costs. And so of course that the system was very interested in that. Uh, we used this retrospective analysis. We matched cohorts of group prenatal care in our practice to women who got individual care in our practice, two to one on prior preterm birth, age, race, ethnicity, language, insurer, Gs and Ps, we matched them two to one to all of those risk factors or, or what we considered as risk factors. And actually what we beautifully found was that our pilot clinic that we, we took actually at that point only um, 56 births at that point because we had had a number of women who had come in and, and done group, and we were saying that you had not completed group unless you'd done at least four sessions. And then we had a few that actually had ended up delivering at another hospital, gone into labor and had vaginal deliveries at the hospital. So I hate that we didn't even get to include them because our numbers would have looked even better. But we took those 56, we compared them to 112 women in our practice who basically are getting the same OB providers, the same LND experience, the same resident providers, but the difference was as one group was in group prenatal care and another group was not. We saw decreases in cesarean birth rates, statistically significant, 33% C-section rate for our standard care moms, 17.9% for our GPC moms. That also told us group prenatal care was an upstream approach to helping to prevent and address maternal morbidity uh, on LND. We also saw a decrease in unexpected NICU admission rates. That was statistically significant, 17%. NICU admissions that were unexpected among moms who received individual care. And we dug into that hard to try to figure out, understand that and figure out why we didn't find it. 1.8% of our patients who had GPC, who were in GPC had NICU admissions. This though, you know, we weren't surprised to find this either because this data wasn't, we weren't the first people to pull back the veil on this. This data had been published in, um, oh, out to your question about systems, this data was published in uh, North Carolina. And so, yes, their system, I believe, had group prenatal care. I do not think they were just in one clinic. I think they did spread across their system. And so when we showed this, and we also showed that we increased savings and avoided by avoiding NICU costs and reducing operating losses for not having as many cesareans, et cetera, we saved somewhere between 160 to $300,000 in their Medicaid ACO plan for, for Partners Healthcare that year. And they had actually wanted to begin to talk to us more about how we could expand group prenatal care across the system for partners healthcare. And then um, we just uh, didn't get to that point. But I do wanna say again, thank you to our Brigham team who's continuing to practice group prenatal care right now as we speak. And so, you know, with that, I then can revise my take home point number three, which is not that it offers a promising solution, but group prenatal care is a patient-centered, high quality, cost-effective, an equity focused alternative to traditional prenatal care that really, really, I'm a, a big fan of, of course, and think that it needs to be um, a part of more systems so that we can really begin to tackle some of these issues related to the poor birth outcomes and the, the rates of preterm birth. I also just wanted to, this is my last slide actually, and then we can get more into some conversation. I know we have seven minutes left in the hour, is that, is this. We also wanted to move policy together. And so as I was working with our Mass Parenting Equality Collaborative, we also worked as a team with the COIN group and the COIN initiative, and we created um, a small group to work on um, putting together this brochure, this pamphlet on how to receive enhanced payments for group prenatal care as an incentive to get folks to do this. Because again, um, as we talk about, you know, wanting to do group prenatal care, remember it is something that takes a good amount of coordination, time and effort in order to make sure that it can get integrated 
work well for everyone, patients and providers, and continue to grow and sustain itself. And so we basically created this entire executive summary and list of recommendations, data and outcome to really encourage our state um, legislators to pass something uh, or encourage Medicaid to pass a policy to really offer enhanced payment because we thought that may be a great incentive. And so happy to share that with anyone. It would need updating for anyone's state, um, but it is a good background um, for anyone to use. And so with that, I wanted to say thank you and, and look through um, some of the other uh, questions, if you have them, Amanda, that may have come up. Thanks, Sandra. This is a great you. presentation. And um, there has been some nice chatting coming in from the centering organization um, and, yeah, and posting of their website. So, so anyway, those are great. One question just came in. How has COVID impacted this model of care? Oh, yes. Oh, good question. I can't believe I didn't put a COVID slide in there. Yes. COVID impacted all models of care by putting us into telemedicine space. And so here, no different groups went to, to, went to virtual spaces. And so right now, as group continues at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I know at other places as well. And thank you, Tanya Monroe also um, commented in the chat about some of the places where group has spread, but the group prenatal care, um, Centering Healthcare Institute has helped and really worked with groups that, are, that have Centering Pregnancy implemented in their sites. She has helped to, um, their team has helped to um, help folks make those adjustments of how to make that work well for folks into the groups and to, to do all the, the parts related to clinical billing and making it a, a really engaging group, et cetera. And so it's moved virtually, but it's, it's remained. And, and people crave this. People crave wanting to get together and have that social support, especially in a time of COVID and, and having that opportunity to talk through what these new policies, because as you all remember, during the year of March 2020 around, the policies on everyone's labor floor would change every couple of months. There'd be something new. And so in order to keep up with what those changing policies were, it's really nice to be able to get on Zoom with four or five and sometimes six to eight women and have those conversations and stay abreast. And so what was beautiful about even us having our centering coordinator was that we were able to use that person to make phone calls to our, our patients and just say, just wanted to let you know, you're not able to bring you know, your spouse or your partner to your clinical visit still because of the COVID rules, but you can bring your baby. We had to fight to let people bring their four and five and six week old to their postpartum visit. Group prenatal care was able to help us to be able to make those changes and to do that. There's another question here. Um, and I also, Amanda, in the meantime, see if uh, Sharon Rising can unmute. I just wanted her to say hi to everyone. And, you know, it's so great that she made time to be here today if she is able to say hi. Um, so I don't know, Sharon, is this a good time for you to say hi to everyone? Sure. Um, Audra, thank you so much for a really, really good presentation. <laughs> Wow, um, it's, it's nice to connect with you again. And I just think uh, you, you gave a really, uh, a really lovely measured presentation that on, on one hand, we want the very best outcomes. We all do for, for our moms and our babies. On the other hand, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> so um, ha putting up really a, a plan for how to move forward uh, with this, uh, um, I think is extremely helpful. So uh, thanks again. And um, I hope you're continuing this good work in California. I hope to too. Thank you so much. Yeah, we both got chills. We're so excited that you're here. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, there was the question, did you see it, Audra, about how difficult was it for many of the patients to put aside two hours for group sessions? Oh, my goodness. I That's one of the funnier questions. So in the beginning, what I would do is I was the person making the phone calls because I really wanted to have them hear my voice and know that your doctor wants you to come do this if, you, if you're interested. And many would tell me they didn't have time. And I'd say, I'm going to write you a letter to your your your, your, your um employer saying today, this particular day that you're coming to your session to give you two hours. I want you to try it once. If it doesn't work out for you, I completely understand. But if you love it, I'll write you a letter that tells them all the dates. It'll all be pre-scheduled. So that way it can help your employer help to arrange your coverage if you need. 
Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can to work with you and your employer to make sure that this doesn't become an imposition, but something that you really enjoy. And I don't have a single person, not one that started it and didn't ask me for that letter at the end of the session <laughs> to make sure that they could come back for all every time for the two hours. Well, I, I'm thinking about my work in clinics. There, the, usually it took two hours to just be waiting for your appointment. So yeah. why not just like have the time more productive? Um, you know, some clinics are blasting like crazy, you know, TV shows, you know. So, so true. You, yeah. True. You're but, there um, anyway. <laughs> I love the letter idea. That was super cool idea. So Amanda, did we miss any other questions? Uh, oh, there's a few more other questions. Yep, there's a question. Um, does group prenatal care reduce PTB rates and save costs more than individualized midwifery care? So, sorry, read that one more time. Does, does group prenatal care reduce PTB okay. rates and save costs more than individualized midwifery care? Oh, I don't know that there's any comparison to individualized midwifery care um, because, you know, the midwifery care model is different in terms of, you know, the time with your provider and, and traditional one-on-one um, -on -one care with your midwife teens, from what I know tends to be more than the time you get when you're in these practices where we've got residents. And I mean, literally, I can tell you stories about patients standing in the hallways, looking out to see when the resident was going to come into their room, you know, so they're, and then they'll get 10 minutes with the, with the provider, but they're, but they've been there for like, to our point earlier, two hours waiting, you know, the, the waiting room wait, and then the wait in the, in the actual exam room. And so I can only imagine that always often played um, poorly with our patients. And I did not see that as the case in our midwifery practices, but I can't, I can't answer that because I don't think I know of any studies that have compared individualized one-on-one -on -one traditional care with midwives to group care. Um, but potentially um, Sharon or some others may know better on that. And I know it's at the hour, but I, this question is so important um, that I just think anyone who can stay on, great. Otherwise, um, well, we, thanks for being here and we're glad you came. And the question is about impact on mental health care. Um, is there any data around mental health care uh, and group prenatal care? And <laughs> I love your son popping in and out. <laughs> You know, I also don't have that either. And I will say that was one of the impetuses of us getting it started is we, we really wanted to work on a on something to help improve the experiences of, of being in our clinical space. Um, and we were um, sort of slated to measure things like stress, perceived stress and resiliency and anxiety. And, and we had these grand ideas of the research we would conduct. And I'll admit it was... Um, such a hard push and pull just to get group to continue to happen and have the, the um, bare bones occur of just delivering the, the clinical care that we did not get to that point yet. And I hope that the folks that are continuing it at Brigham and Women's will do some of that work. We had the, the instruments ready to go, um, but I don't have that information either. And I think that potentially if anyone's had enough um, uh, volume and time to do it. Maybe there's some work that had come out of um, North Carolina, but I'm not aware of it. And, and, and we'll definitely go back and look now and see if I can reach Amy Picklesheimer and find out. That's great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I think there's much more. This is so uh, such a great presentation. Uh, Dr. Meadows, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. And again, you will the recording will be on the website, Amanda said later today. Um, and so you can be able to access it and feel free to share it widely. We want, we do these webinars, they're free. We wanna get out good work, QI does save lives. And so thank you for everyone coming here today and um, all the best.